last week. So what I thought we'd do is kind of uh, look at things again, now seeing what has actually happened. So just to kind of recap a little bit, um, Israel's at a war with Hamas. Uh, in the process of that, Hezbollah, uh, Hamas is in the Gaza Strip, so uh, the southern part of the coast there. Northern part of the coast, as you go out of Israel, is Lebanon. So the southern part of Lebanon has a group called uh, Hezbollah. So they both started firing. And then there are other um, terrorist groups uh, that might be in Syria and in Iraq and just different places as prophesied in scripture. So these have been causing problems for Israel for quite a while. And so in the midst of this last one, uh, they decided in a war situation to try to eliminate all of the heads of the terrorist organization. One was identified as being an Iranian person who, and again, this is all allegedly, I guess, but basically someone uh, who is in the Iranian guard that masterminded or helped organize the Hamas to attack. So Israel then, uh, at a certain point, sent a small missile or drone or something into uh, Syria by the embassy and attacked, destroyed one room where he was at. So in other words, uh, an assassination of that particular general in connection with Hamas. So follow, in the days following, Iran responded uh, by sending over, over 300 ballistic missiles, uh, drones, and uh, cruise missiles at the state of Israel. And that's pretty interesting because it's uh, that's unprecedented that any country uh, would send that many uh, missiles to attack uh, on one small state like that. So the first time in history that much has been hit that quickly all in one day. And it's interesting between the the uh, countries allied with Israel and Israel all together, the jets, those kind of things, Israelis um, Iron Dome, which is a, a missile that comes up and fires and hits and destroys an incoming missile. So we have the same thing in the United States. We usually call them Patriot missiles. So they're not really good for sending a nuke or anything out over and then attacking somebody. They just short range to destroy whatever's coming in through the air. So that, and also this is the first time that Israel used its iron beam, which is a laser system. And if you've been watching or if you watched it last week, really interesting to kind of see all of that stuff happen and uh, um, first time in a situation of a real war, not just practice or testing, but in a real war situation, the iron beam worked very, very well. So we've kind of crossed over now in the last decade or so with warfare instead of being tanks and people uh, crossed over to missiles, which has been for a while, and then crossed over from missiles to drones. Uh, I remember back in World War II, my parents who were in World War II, dad was in the Navy, talked about the kamikaze pilots from Japan. And that's their their concept, uh, kind of like an old-fashioned drone. You have to have somebody piloting it to, and it, they make it over here, and they literally crash the plane, commit suicide, de destroying whatever the target is. And so now we have automated systems to make them hit properly. So we have these drones and then the drones, instead of just a guided missile, is able to intelligently figure out how to go off course so that it doesn't get hit, come back on course, things like that. So really interesting. But then this last week, for the first time in the history of warfare, laser systems to knock drones and missiles and stuff out of the air. So anyway, what was interesting about it is that major amount of an attack to be thwarted by any and all that stuff for, for that matter. But 99% of all that stuff knocked out of the air. That says something pretty interesting. Um, and so Israel's response was to go in and attack. And I, again, the speculation on what they're thinking, how they're thinking, if they're waiting to do something else or finishing it up or just kind of letting it go. But at least it was a message. They went in and attacked 
presumably so, some reports are saying what happened other reports are saying nothing really happened and all sorts of different ideas mainly i think to save face you know because if you attack me and i say yes it was definitely you then i have to attack back otherwise i'm going to look bad that kind of stuff um so anyway that's going on but what was interesting is supposedly eight or nine sites were attacked what was attacked is the radar systems in those places and they were very very close to uh, the nuclear sites so basically that's a way to go in do very little damage if anything but it's a uh, a, a very bold statement if i could send in a missile or a drone or something if it gets through your radar systems you didn't even know it was coming in and it took out the radar system that's protecting the nuclear site I think we probably could have taken out the nuclear site. I mean, that's just a logical thing that's going on. So it's a very, very powerful message. So at this point, Iran is like, well, we don't know exactly what happened. So we're not going to do anything. So we'll see how that goes. Now, we're going to look at some prophecies. We looked at them last night. We're going to look or last week, but we're going to look at them again, just kind of see some other things, kind of pull a, a lot of stuff together. So first off, I wanted to uh, set the stage for this a little bit, talking about end time prophecy. So I wanted to go to one of her books, Ancient Prophecies Revealed. And we're in this section, we're talking about uh, the 10 kingdoms and everything that's coming up, which is post 2008. We wrote this book in 2008. A lot of you have been asking for us to do an update on it. We're in the process of creating a second one. So we're getting there. But uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, and I've talked about this a little bit before, but this kind of really homes in the point. People say, I think we're in the last days. I'm pretty sure we're in the last days or we've got to be in the last days. Well, you can go to scriptures and find out if you are or not. And, and here's the whole concept. The, the Lord talks about what's called the birth pangs. And I think I've got that in. Well, we'll look at that here in a little bit. But when Israel comes back in their land, and that was 1948, that began the time period of the birth pangs. Or it's also called in this particular book, the crossover period. It's the time when the church is still here. The rapture hasn't happened yet, but Israel is also back. And this happened the first time, the first crossover period. And we, we can see it in this book and in other, other charts, but the first hundred years anyway, or more or less, is when Israel was here, it hadn't been dispersed out of the land yet, and the church was still here. And then Israel's dispersed, gone, and it's the church age. And we can see that pattern in the seven church ages in the seven churches of Revelation, which is also mentioned in Zechariah. But anyway, along those lines, when this begins to happen, prophecies begin to be understood. So, for instance, a lot of people uh, pre-1948 for some reason today, even you run across people that say uh, Israel has nothing to do with Bible prophecy. Uh, there is no it's just a coincidence that they're here because we're Israel and, you know, the promises have been switched over this the replacement theology. And I can see where they get that from Scripture. I can see it both ways. And so pre 1948, it's it's conjecture. It's a good guess, but it's still conjecture because it hasn't happened yet that Israel would come back in the land. But then in 1948, they did. Then you go back and you look at the prophecies, uh, the timeline prophecies, and are very detailed. It comes out to the day where the Messiah comes to die for our sins. 32 AD is when that was supposed to happen. Uh, the other timeline prophecy is Israel's return as a nation. is supposed to be in 1948. And then the, the third timeline prophecy is Israel's supposed to take back the Temple Mount, but not build a temple. And I believe there is a scroll that tells us when the temple would be rebuilt, but we'll talk about that later. Um, right now, as that, that's speculation. You know, even if it specifically said that, it's still speculation until it happens. Okay, so, but at least 1948 uh, or two, 20, 32 AD, 1948, 1967 are, are dedicated to this. So some of the church fathers and the other writings talk about this time. This is when things begin to be set up 
but we don't instantly have a rapture, a seven year period, an antichrist just on the spot. Things take a while. We can see this by Jesus in the first century when he was born. He didn't start his ministry until he was 30, his three and a half year ministry. He died. And then the church was born on Pentecost. And then some 38 to 40 years later, destruction of the temple. And then at the end of which uh, is the end of the age. Still, though, there is Israel hanging on doing things. And then they kind of come back at last ditch effort to create the, the small state under Bar Kokhba in the 130s. And so by, by 132 to 135, somewhere in there, the Romans crushed it, kicked all the Jews out. And from that time forward, there is no state of Israel. Okay. And so that's what happens. So you've got all of these things. Almost everything we see is a process. There's a specific date, either recorded or not, when something starts like a war and something ends and we're done. But the setup for that usually takes some time. So what this is saying, here's Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. It says, uh, but as for you, Daniel, conceal these words. They're talking prophecy at the end of chapter 12 or in, in 11 and 12. And it says, conceal these words, seal them up. Uh, until the time of the end or the end time. Many will go back and forth or to and fro, it says in King James, and knowledge will increase. So when we get to the end times, certain kind of end times, not the, the, the tribulation period, but, but we get a certain period. So when does that start? The end times, then knowledge begins to increase. And one of the things that I thought noticed a long time ago before I started studying the Dead Sea Scrolls is there's a quote from Irenaeus, who was a church father back around 170-ish. He wrote uh, a book, a five-volume series called Against Heresies, against the cults of his day. So he says, Daniel the prophet says, and he quotes this particular verse, shut up the words, seal the book, even to the time of consummation. Now, consummation is used in a couple of other places, like in Luke and in Matthew, uh, where you see uh, Anna, the prophetess, and Simeon in the temple. And it talks about them talking about the time of consummation. And the, the um, basically, there's their words talking about the end of an age when prophecies occur. And so we're consistently taught that prophecies, there's prophecies about things all the way through time. But when you get to the end of an age, a lot of prophecies happen. So, for instance, in the time of Christ being here, there's some 100, 100 and some prophecies, depending on how you count them. Multiple prophets will predict the same thing. So you could count that as one prophecy or maybe even seven, but lots of prophecies. And in the Middle Ages, very few. I think we counted 23 in the 1800 years. So, and then now since Israel's come back, there's been, well, at the writing of this book, it was 50, but there's actually been quite a bit more. So anyway, he says, uh, seal the book until the prophecies will be sealed, confused, hidden away until the time of consummation, which is towards the end of time. So that last Jubilee period, or as they call it, the last generation, until many learn and knowledge will be completed. Okay. So then he gives his, and that's, that's his version of that verse. Then he gives his interpretation of it. He says, for at that time, what time? When the dispersion shall be accomplished. And that's kind of a weird term. It, it's an old English term. This is a, a quote from the Antinocene Fathers written back in the 1800s. So basically we're talking about not the start of it, but when the the prophesied expulsion is said and done. So in other words, the Jews were kicked out of their land and then at a certain time that's ended and they come back. So this me basically is saying for at that time, the time when knowledge is completed, many run to and fro to complete the knowledge. That is when the dispersion is accomplished. So that's 1948. Then they shall know all these things. So what's going to happen is as Israel's born, you're going to have um, knowledge completed. 
So there's certain things we're missing, uh, certain details that help us figure out prophecies. And starting in 1948, something changes to complete this knowledge. And that is the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I didn't talk about it in this book, but basically uh, Isaiah 29 talks about the time when Israel comes back for the second time. The old ones begin to speak out of the dust of the earth. And so we have this whole concept um, coming out here. So this is interesting. So this begins what is called by him and other people, the birth pangs. So it's the time not when Messiah is here or the kingdom is here, but things are beginning to change. We've had Gentiles for 1800 years ruling the land of Israel, and now Israel comes back. And then there's a series of prophecies and it goes in stages. And that's what we're seeing here with Iran as one such prophecy. Um, let me pull up one other thing here. I want to show you. Here's our e-sword. This is the prophecy of the Gog Magog invasion. I just want to show you one thing. Just make sure you're aware of it. Uh, long story short, Magog is southern Russia. So this is a future prophecy of Russia coming and attacking Israel. I know some people try to say it means other things. And the reason they do that is because the Magogites broke up and went a couple of different places. So there were some of their descendants in Turkey, some in southern Russia, some in different places. So I can see how you're doing that. It can't be United States, for instance. It was never colonized. We were colonized by the British and the French and the Spanish, you know, uh, not Magogites. So, but you can kind of see where that goes on. And you have to go back to the ancient records, uh, the like early um, po post flood. So Josephus, Jasher, uh, Seder Alam, there's several other ancient history books that basically just tell you some guy named this went here, started his groups like my, I'm Ken. So I, my kids would be the Kenites and we live here. Some of them later break off. And so it's an interesting study to do that, but it's very important for the study of prophecy. So anyway, this is a Russian attack on Israel, but people come with Russia. Russia doesn't conquer these people. And so they're all Russia, for instance, it's Russia and her allies. But down in verse five, it starts talking about some of these Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with them. This is King James. And so Persia is Iran. So that's very, very clear. Libya is what we call modern Libya, but it extended along the coast. Didn't go down that far, but basically northern Africa. But today it's Libya. So it's as far as a nation coming against somebody, it wouldn't be the coast of Africa. It would be Libya and it would be Iran. And this one, Ethiopia, Ethiopia back in this day was the entire land from Egypt down to the to the coast. So that later split between Ethiopia and Sudan. Now, recently in the last decade or so, Sudan has split between North Sudan and South Sudan. So we're probably looking at Iran, Libya, uh, along with Egypt. There's other prophecies. And then the Ethiopia one would be Northern Sudan. That's speculation because it hasn't happened yet. But we'll see. It's got to be the peoples there somewhere. Uh, North Sudan is hardcore Muslims where they have the slave trade. Um, the leader is wanted in multiple countries for war crimes. Southern Sudan is a somewhat Christian nation. I think it's technically Christian because of that. They don't persecute. So you've got lots of different ethnic religions down there, uh, or officially they don't persecute. I don't know how that goes. Um, but usually a Jewish or a Christian group nation doesn't persecute until some weird time of war happens and then Gomer and his band. So this is a really interesting when you identify all of these people to find out who's attacking who. But for our purposes, I just wanted to let you know that when this occurs, Persia was with them. So Persia is not destroyed. Uh, Iran, in other words, is not destroyed. I, it doesn't become a Christian nation like it says in Jeremiah, at least till after this. So it gives us some clues on what happens when and what wars are connected. So Persia being here is the one thing I wanted to show you. 
So we go through, and there's other prophecies that happen at this point, but I want to show you the birth pangs. So from the New Testament, this time period from 1948 forward, we have uh, things that the Lord talks about. Number one, and in this book, we, we, we have over 500 prophecies, but we could put them in order of fulfillment. So uh, if it's possible, there's a reference, there's a date of the, when it was prophesied, the date of fulfillment. But anyway, so this is still future or ongoing. And Jesus said many false Christs would come. There would be wars and rumors of wars. So that's really important for us to know. There will be real wars, so you do have to be prepared. But there's always going to be these threats, constant threats. And that happens in Israel all the time. They're always at war. Somebody's always firing a little missile. And if they don't do something, it'll turn into a real war. But there's always a problem, constantly. Um, not just in Israel, but other places. But there's also going to be famines and earthquakes and pestilences. And I thought that's interesting. Um, it doesn't exactly fit perfectly, but depending on how it was originally written, especially since this is Matthew, uh, it says wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and pestilences. So this is uh, in verse six and seven of that chapter. So it's possible we could be saying there's war, there's rumors, the real things and rumors of, and then wars, famines, earthquakes, and pestilences. And I think that's interesting because we will have biological warfare. We will also have the threat of biological warfare. We'll have real wars. We'll also have the threat of, of wars. Uh, we'll have real earthquakes. And if ever anyone ever comes out and says there are ways to make earthquakes, uh, I mean, admits it and the populace believes it, then that will be a threat also, a threat of retaliation. And there are ways to do that. It's just really hard to control where it manifests. So it's not the greatest weapon to use. But anyway, so all those together, plagues will be widespread. It says, fearful events and signs from heaven will be seen. I think it was interesting with this last war, uh, a week or two beforehand, like around the time of the assassination of the guy in Syria and then the Iranian attack along those lines, there was a whole lot, if you go on YouTube, a lot of weird things happening, a whole bunch of earthquakes in various places, uh, some pretty decent ones in Iran. There were odd shooting stars, uh, you know, in, in the skies around Iran in multiple places. And that's always going to be in a large nation. You could always look up sometime, I'm sure, during the month and see something. But it's interesting when those things come together like that. So... Um, I'm not one for omens. We're told not to look for omens. But when you're told prophecies happen at a certain time, and then there are floods and other weird things going on, that's probably a sign from the Lord. Josephus talks about when the temple, right, right before the temple was destroyed, there were a whole bunch of different weird signs. It sounded like people battling like up there somewhere and you could see lights and stuff at, at night, but you know, nobody's there. Um, there was a, a one report where there was like an attack or a skirmish in the temple, like somebody was ransacking it or something. So the guards go in the temple. There's nobody there. Everything's fine. There is no battle and nobody's there. So it was like a weird sound. That, but as they were there looking and deciding there's nobody here, then all of a sudden they said there was a voice that occurred that said, leave this place. That, that would spook me out enough. I think I would leave. So, and there's a whole lot of other things like that. And some of them may be fiction. It makes sense to me that if, if it would happen, it would happen the way it's described. So there's a whole lot of things from Eusebius, Josephus, and other writings. So we should take these things uh, seriously. Most things are not going to be anything, but when there's a series of them, and we already have prophecies about them, we need to look at them. So plagues, fearful signs, religious persecution is supposed to occur, discord among churches. They tend to bicker back and forth. This is what I think is amazing because got, you guys know I'm pre-trib, like a Calvary Chapel. Um, and if you're post-trib or mid-trib, I would say you're wrong. There's reasons why I think you're wrong and I'm right, but 
we'll see. Again, nothing's concrete until it happens. When it happens, we'll know who was right for sure. Now, I think I can prove that really easy, but that's not the point. The point is we shouldn't argue amongst ourselves. As long as you're not calling me a heretic and I'm calling you a heretic, you know, if, if you're going to ask me like the Skog Magog War, is it before, during, or after the rapture? No clue. I have a theory, but I can't really prove it. So if you want to say I'm totally wrong on that, we shouldn't be arguing, especially prophecy, because there's a lot of things like that. Now, morality is very concrete in scripture. So anyway, uh, the falling away occurs. False prophets arise. There's lots of false prophets and false teachers. Um, lawlessness increases. The love of many grows cold. And severe ocean activity occurs, especially one super hurricane that develops. But anyway, there's things like that. Now, that's from Scripture. And I wanted to just point out, if we run down here, here is the Jewish version of the birth pangs. And I think it's interesting how they can somehow get around the Messiah part, but half the time have some of the prophecies right. So in the Talmud, Sanhedrin 97b, it talks about um, descriptions or things that happen during the birth pangs of the Messiah, which again is 1948 forward. So things that are going to happen may or may not have happened even yet, but it's in this time period. The world will be in a state of complete degradation. I don't think it's quite that bad yet, but it's a lot worse than it seemed like it 50 years ago. Everything seemed to be pretty decent. Everything's going weird now. Um, truth will decrease and lies will prevail. We definitely see that going on. And this is interesting, unique to this. Inflation will be out of control. That's pretty interesting. Now, again, we're not necessarily talking about over here. This should be focused on Israel. But if it's something touching Israel hard, it's probably a problem for a lot of people and maybe the entire globe, like a plague. You know, so the plague, if the plague is wiping out Israel, there's a chance it's over here, too. So, I mean, it's connected in that way. Uh, the Jews return to their biblical homeland and the desert will bloom. And I thought that was pretty interesting. A lot of people say this whole thing is fulfilled. The Jews have returned to their homeland as prophesied on the date prophesied. That was back in 48. Uh, the desert blooming, though, the word for desert in that particular passage that's being quoted when you look at the Old Testament one is Negev. So the, the Negev is colonized as prophesied in Obadiah uh, and begins to bloom. So most of Israel is that way, but not the south, not the Negev. So, but it's in process. So again, that, that whole thing, it's started, but it's not finished. As far as the Jews returning home and starting a nation, that part's finished. As far as them finishing that whole concept, many Jews come in different time periods. And so I think it was in the early or mid 2000s AD that finally there were more Jews in Israel than, than in other places. So it's, it's getting there. With wars, some of them may decide to go to the United States or other places. Many Jews will give up their hope for redemption. It becomes secular. I thought that was interesting. There are a lot of secular Jews over there. Uh, there will be fewer. I didn't miss the first one here. There will be fewer and fewer wise and righteous people. The young will treat the old with disrespect. And learning will be rejected because of the ease and a desire, a desire for the ease of life. I think that's interesting. Some of us, like me, I am just way too curious. I'll die here looking at a scroll. That's what's going to happen. Hopefully not for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But that is what will happen. I will be standing here looking at a scroll. I just am that curious, whatever is there. Um, and people would probably look at me like I'm crazy. It's like, whatever happens, happens, go have a party. Well, different concepts for different people. The whole world will turn against Israel. So that's interesting. And then the Jews will fight each other. And that could be a uh, secular versus religious. It could be messianic versus, it could be a bunch of different things, but there's going to be some turmoil amongst themselves. That's probably not so much the case at the moment because when you've got enemies around your country all trying to kill all of you, 
you pretty much are brothers. You better be or you're dead. Now, when peace comes and that's okay, then things happen. Well, we kind of see that all the different government structures always fight in each other. When the Hamas war happened, they're together, at least for a while until the war is over. So that's pretty interesting. Wanted to kind of share that with you. So let's go back and look at these prophecies. Again, uh, we've got um, the one we just looked at with um, um, an e-sword. I'm losing my train of thought. Yeah, Ezekiel, the, the Magog War, the fact that Persia is still there. So in this case, we had a war. I mean, it looks like they shot enough missiles that nobody could do anything. I mean, it's probably going to destroy everything. If they have a really good defense system, they're going to be decimated, but return fire. And in this case, 99% of everything was just blew up, went up in smoke. And then Israel showed that we could really do some damage if we wanted to. I suggest you calm down. And they calm down. I mean, what else are you going to do? So in, in other words, this kind of round, this round, of stuff is over but this has been the first time in history that iran has attacked israel and it happens in a different way next time so we're seeing the process beginning so if we go to I'll come out of here this is enoch we're going to look at this again but <clears throat> this is talking about the fallen angels and then it says in those days the angels return and come to the kings of the east along with the Medes and the Persians, which is Iran, Persians specifically. And they will stir up these kings. I, I should mention this. This, it, this particular one always blows me away because it's when the angels return. We know pre-flood those angels did genetic manipulation. And we've got a lot of Dead Sea Scrolls. We're going through the, the Enoch study. And doing that, we, we pulled in several other Dead Sea Scrolls to kind of fill in the gaps. But... Putting that together, if angels return and they do anything close to what they were doing back then, uh, somebody's going to be inventing some very powerful biological weapons, at the very least, um, to alter a bacteria or a virus has got to be a lot easier than creating a Pegasus or something. You know, that's what I'm saying. So if there's anything like that at all, it would start with genetically modified foods, be that good or bad, but just the technology and then something else. And these angels are going to be doing who knows what. And it starts with the Medes and the Persians. So to me, it's interesting. It's like if I'm putting this together right, uh, the Persians have these drones that at the moment don't work that great, but in time they'll be perfect. Um, they have armaments and stuff from Russia. Um, and so you've got all this technology, but in addition to that kind of technology, robots, drones, things like that, lasers, what about the biological side? If these angels are back or even a few of them, that's going to be a part of it too. Now we haven't seen anything like that from Iran. Uh, you know, we've seen the, the genetic experiments and things from the United States, from Russia, uh, the bases supposedly in the Ukraine, you know, and things like that, China. And then we've had the viruses and things like that that have come out uh, just from experimentation. Not that that's got anything to do with angels, but the technology is prophesied to come back, at least the technology. So we'll, we'll be studying that in the near future. So, um, so it says that they stir these kings up with a spirit of unrest that comes over them. And they will rouse them from their thrones that they may break forth as lions from their lairs like hungry wolves among the flock. They'll go up and tread underfoot the land of his elect ones, that's Israel, and the land of his elect ones will be before them like a threshing floor, like a highway. But the city of my righteousness, Jerusalem, will be a hindrance to their horses, and they will begin to fight amongst themselves. Now, one of the things I thought was interesting when I was studying Ezekiel 38, it talks about horses, and bows and arrows, shields and bucklers, going up and attacking. Nobody does that today. We push buttons. And there's been theories about, well, if there was a tactical nuke, an EMP, then all that would be fried. 
the only thing you could do would be to like have a sword and go out on a horse and then, you know, whatever. Um, and there's ways to protect those things too. The military anyway, I'm sure would have at least some of it protected. So anyway, so that kind of stuff happens. Um, but when you look at like the chariots, one of the most advanced tanks that Israel has is called a Markva, which is a tank or a chariot, the old name. And one of the things that I always kind of squinted at, though, is this word here, the horses. Now, this is um, the Enoch text. So that is Giez. We don't have this particular one in Hebrew, so I can't tell you what it is. But when you look at Ezekiel 38 in the Hebrew, the word for horses is sus. And in, in when I took Hebrew, they, they just told me sus means horse. That's all it means. We're done. And then I began to look up root words. Um, and the word sus for horse actually means someone who leaps or flies. Sometimes, and, and if you go back and you look this up, in one place in the Old Testament, the same word is used for a crane. So a crane is a, you don't ride a crane. Crane, it's a, it's a medium-sized bird, so nobody resets on it. But it is one of the fastest flying uh, creatures. So if you're trying to describe something that leaps over stuff, a horse is a perfect example because if you put down, not mines necessarily, but if you put down something to stop a large group of people coming through, the horses can just simply leap over them. So that's the whole concept with horses you can get through. Um, and you compare that to a crane that would actually just pick up and fly right over it very fast. By the way, you probably wouldn't be able to shoot it down with a bow, bow and arrow. So with this in mind, you can translate these things to, you know, and, and a bow and arrow literally is a flying object with a launcher. You know, and anciently that's a bow and arrow like we think. But the same words can mean what they do rather than those objects. So some sort of a, a leaping thing to fly into, cross over with. Tanks now run right over stuff. Merkvas or, or tanks or horses. Horses for that, bows and arrows, rocket launchers with rockets. And then, of course, now we have drones. So the rockets are even getting old fashioned. Anyway, just wanted to mention that. So just because it says horses or shields, um, a shield is something you put up to protect yourself. So, you know, the Israeli defense system, the, uh, the shields that they could have would be the missile defense system and now the iron beam iron dome it's a shield so it's kind of interesting to see that so these don't don't look at this and say well this has to just be a thousand years ago it can't be now but it goes on and says that the right hand will be strong against themselves a man will not know his brother nor a son a father or mother there will be no number of their corpses through their own slaughter that hasn't even begun to happen nobody has been injured well, there might be one or two people in a base that got blown up or injured when something was struck. But other than some injuries or maybe a couple of fight fatalities, if they happen to be standing right on top of the, the radar system when it got hit or something. But as far as like populations, there's, there's no large population or even small set of population that have been killed. But this is that thing that we keep seeing about how they get confused. The Lord sends confusion. They attack each other. Um, and it goes on, but this here, I'm, I'm assuming this is the Gog Magog war, but it may or may not be, but we're talking about the attack of Iran against Israel. So we've had one and it's been completely nullified. And unless somebody does something else again, uh, it's going to be a while because they're going to try to have to figure out what's happened. I think it's interesting, too, that the, the systems they have, like the S, I think it's called the S-300s, supposed to be the most advanced radar system on the planet. And I remember a decade or two back, there was a report that Russia's tired of Israel coming in and bombing Syria. They want to build bases and stuff. So they gave Syria not weapons per se like that, but the the, the defense system. So there is no way Israel could even come close to getting in. And they will be shot down by Russian troops. 
if they're detected on radar. And I remember everybody saying like, well, that's it. That's it's over. I mean, what can you do? They'll know I'm coming. And I remember it was like a month later, something happened. Israel decided to attack and the radar system goes out for 10 minutes. Nobody knows why or how. It's not like it's necessarily a cyber attack, but just somehow something's jammed or nobody see and just for 10 minutes and they come back on and there's no nobody saw any planes come in or go out or hear anything or you know but the targets that were the problem are all destroyed and then you know five feet to the left there's a house with people in it and they're fine very surgical surgical attack and so it's interesting and i thought that was interesting because they were saying the um um in iran they had these s300 systems very very advanced but again somehow they blow up and nobody knows how so israel's got some pretty advanced weaponry so anyway so this happened and it's apparently over but it's the first time iran attacked what we just read is maybe a second or a third but sometime when they attack and we've got the corpses so that very much sounds like the Gog Magog war. But then it says it comes to pass after this, after this whole thing, and there's a slaughter and they're all dead. That would be the end of a war, unless someone else comes in, but it's a different thing. After all this, I saw another host of men riding on wagons, tanks, coming on the winds so these people ride in on winds that would be helicopters jets or something for men to fly in from the east and from the west to the south the noise of the wagons are heard and the turmoil takes place this says it's interesting that this is so bad that the pillars of the earth were moved from their place now the one that we just read i thought was pretty bad no end of the corpses but the pillars of the earth are not moved. This sounds like some sort of nuclear thing, detonation, I mean, mass destruction of the area rather than just people. The sound was heard from one end of heaven to the other in one day. So that's pretty interesting. And then it ends by saying, eventually everyone will fall and bend the knee to the Lord of Spirits, which is what Paul says also. So comparing this to the last day's stuff in Ezra, this is the Ezra apocalypse also. And then we'll, time's running away from us. But again, uh, the, the last day is morality. This is in the birth pangs part. It says, behold, says the Lord, I will bring plagues upon the world, sword, famine, death, and destruction. The wickedness has horribly polluted the entire earth and their hurtful works are fulfilled. So there's a time of judgment at a certain point. Therefore, says the Lord, I will not hold my tongue anymore as touching their profanity, committed wickedness, or their profanely committed wickedness. Neither will I allow them to continue practicing it. Behold, innocent and righteous blood cries to me, and the souls of the just complain continually. Thus says the Lord, I will surely receive the innocent slain by them and will avenge them so this is pretty interesting about how all that comes through and then there's a thing about the destruction of egypt now we know that egypt is decimated when the antichrist is here because egypt is probably the head of the three that of the ten nations that come against the antichrist whether that's correct or not again we don't know it's speculation but egypt is mentioned specifically in daniel and other places is coming against the king of the north and he comes down and wipes them out part of this war whether it's a plague the lord does it or he does it with like a tactical nuke or whatever but the result is that the nile dries up so somewhere back up in the mountains where the nile starts from there is a disturbance and the water goes elsewhere so that's why it's one major thing i hear a lot of people today saying we're in the tribulation period has the Nile River dried up? No. Okay, well, then we're not in the tribulation period. You know, that's just one prophecy, but there's actually quite a few. Um, so anyway, Egypt will mourn. Its foundation will be struck with the plague and the punishment God will bring upon it. 
Okay, and then it's interesting to me, there's wars and famine. Woe to those who dwell in the world, who dwell therein, for their destruction by the sword draws near. One people will stand up and fight against another with hand weapons. And you see this over and over again, um, this whole concept of like, say, the Muslims come in to destroy the Christians. Uh, or or something like that. Two groups that are friendly come in to destroy the other guy. And they get confused and they attack each other. And they wind up killing each other. And then the innocent person is standing there watching this. So this, it doesn't happen all the time, but it seems like when God steps in, there are multiple cases in the Old Testament where God did this with nations. They went to attack Israel, got confused. And it's got to be supernatural. I mean, if I hate you and I'm going to try to kill you, how do I get confused and think they're you? And then they actually think I'm you. So we're doing this thing over here and then you're fine. So there's something very interesting going on. They will not regard their kings, their rulers by the course of their actions or usurp power. A man will desire to go into a city, but will not be able. Because of the pride of the usurpers, the cities will be troubled, the houses will be destroyed, and the men will be afraid. And so there's going to be great tribulation at that point. But in here, this is interesting to me, and we talked about this last week. And I wanted to point out just a couple of extra things here. Um, actually, we'll skip this part here, but... They attack Israel, and this is basically just saying there's a coalition of Iran, what we would call Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iraq, and Lebanon. But something happened. They all decide we're going to band together and to destroy Israel. But something happens, and they get confused. It's the same confusion again. And it's interesting because we have this thing called the Dragon Nations. And it talks about that there are this horrible vision occurs from the east uh, where the dragon nations of Arabia will come from with chariots, again, tanks. Multitude of them will be carried uh, as the wind upon the earth, fast flying vehicles. All those who hear them will tremble. So what we're seeing in here, and there's a lot to unpack in here, and I think part of it hasn't been fulfilled yet, which is why it seems confusing. And let me just say this, we need to uh, be very, very familiar with Daniel, all the pieces of Daniel, all the 12 chapters, um, not so much Revelation, because that's mainly end time after we're gone. But as far as understanding what's going on now up to the rapture, we need to understand Daniel very well. And there are other passages in Obadiah, Zephaniah, pieces of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Uh, for the wars going on. And then we could begin to speculate how they go together and watch what's happening. And uh, we, we need to understand the calendar system that the Dead Sea Scrolls has. And that's what we're trying to do here is plug in the dates and times timelines and stuff. Not trying to set a future date unless there's a scroll that says something like that. No guessing, you know, playing with numbers, but just trying to pull scrolls together whatever is written down and then we might have that backwards but at least we can look at it then there's the ezra apocalypse which is what we're looking at now the book of gad the seer uh several other dead sea scrolls and then works that the dead sea scrolls mention that we don't have so we're still looking for these other scrolls trying to put back together the uh, school of the prophets but this is interesting because it's mainly an arab thing but it says that the Camarnians, which are the, the Iranians, basically, or the parent group of the Iranians, uh, join in this and attack. And there's another place down here that talks about Turkey. So Turkey and Iraq are not Arabs. They have the same religion. And whether it's the same religion or not, they still may, may be on that other guy's side during a war. But it's interesting the way it's described. So you have these dragon nations of Arabia, you have joining them, Arab nations, 
um, Turkey, and Iran. Now, that's not to say that all Arab nations are a part of this. It's saying that this um, religion or this concept started in Saudi Arabia, Mecca, Medina. So we're talking about Islam. And that goes along with Gad, who describes it in a different way, saying the exact same things. But I want you to notice this. They, they attack. They will lay waste a portion, portion of the land of Syria. Now, if you're thinking about this, we're talking about the Iranians that lay waste a portion of Syria. They don't necessarily attack Syria, but you've seen what's been going on is they send weapons through proxies through Iraq into Syria, and then hopefully it gets from Syria to Lebanon, and then from Lebanon to Hezbollah, and then maybe down into Gaza. That's the, that's the whole idea to ship weapons like this. And at one point, I remember them trying to cut straight through, uh, this was like a decade or so back, trying to cut straight through Jordan. And Jordan asked for his, Israel's help, and they took care of the problem. Interesting battles. We One thing I think we need to know to do is have a good handle on modern Israeli history. You're only talking about 1948 to the present. So there's only been like, 10 or 15 wars, skirmishes, and they started here at this date and ended this way, and this is what happened. Especially the older ones, we should know all, be able to get all the details just to have a feel of how things have been going because they'll probably continue go, going the same way. Uh, but it, then it says the dragons have the upper hand. They will remember their true nature, turn on themselves, conspiring together with great power, to persecute other. So what happens is during this whole thing, before Israel decides to start this war and then go up this side and eliminate Gaza, then Hezbollah, and then go that way. What happens is a group of dragon nations, Islamic terrorist group of some sort, is funded by Iran apparently and others. And it's, it's in this process and it's east of Syria. The prophecy later on shows this. And so what happens is they all of a sudden kind of wake up and decide we're our own thing. So they're not going to take orders anymore from anybody and they become independent. We saw this as ISIS. I remember a ways back, it got so bad. We actually, I was actually beginning to think the Antichrist is supposed to come from a nation north of Israel. So that's always been, that's either Lebanon, Syria, or Iraq. That's unless you go further up, like, you know, but it should be right there somewhere. So any one of those or those coming together and it got so bad, I was beginning to think, well, maybe ISIS forms and maybe there's going to be four now, Lebanon, Syria, ISIS, whatever they call their nation, if they make one, and then Iraq. But uh, the official story is that I, ISIS was co totally decimated, destroyed, doesn't exist anymore, gone, we're fine. And according to this prophecy, that's not exactly what happens. Long story short is they basically get decimated. The remnant of them picks up and goes to the far north. Well, the far north would be Russia. So apparently they have something to do with the hook that pulls Russia down. I don't think they are the hook per se, but they're part of the deal. I had read the other day, and I don't know how true this is, but I'd read the other day that at least 41% of the Russian military are Muslim. And so it's getting to be an interesting problem. But if most of the Russian military are Muslim and they want to attack, that, that um, puts this in this time period. So if that's the case, you would see why Russia, Iran, Turkey, and all that kind of stuff would come together. Um, Turkey, however, does something different according to this. And when we get down here, just real briefly, this is the summary of this thing. If we went and looked at it, uh, the dragon nations appear as a, as a thing based out of Saudi Arabia, again, Mecca, Medina. They attack Syria. They attack from the east of Syria. Iran joins the dragon nations, and, you know, funds them, joins them somehow. Part of Syria is laid waste. Islam fragments and then ISIS forms and then there's an attack from the north and the south or to the south. 
So that's what's going on. And then there's more down here. Basically, there is a major attack. It starts from the east again, which is east of Syria. And its war is raged with things that fly on the wind. So it's got missiles involved, missiles or drones or something. And basically, there's this thing here about Turkey siding with Babylon. And I've never, I'm still not absolutely sure who Babylon is, if it's the, just the religious concept of any one group, or if, it's, if it ends up being headquartered in Iraq, or if it's, you know, what it is. And, and there may be both, because in Revelation, we have what seems to be religious Babylon and a commercial Babylon. So it might be different things like that. But it's interesting how Turkey kind of takes the other side. They're Islamic, they're pro-Islamic, they want to restart the empire, etc. But somehow they're different. Now they have joined NATO and or they're they're at least in that process, they're trying to figure things out. They may or may not stay, but it's it's kind of iffy. But so out of all of them, they're the ones that have kind of pulled away for a different reason. But it's interesting to see how all of these things come come to bat. So basically, the summary of this part is that uh, Turkey puts its hope in Babylon. So that means, number one, Turkey is not Babylon. So there you go. That's at least a piece of the puzzle. Um, uh, it decks its its daughters with whoredom, like Babylon. It, and I don't know what the daughters of Turkey would be like the daughters of Babylon, but there's some sort of a connection there. Fornicates with nations, receives plagues, is prideful, kills Jews, and is drunk with the blood of believers. So it's really interesting. Again, it's not Babylon for somehow, but it's very pro-Babylon. So there's a lot more stuff in here that we could look at, but basically uh, there's several really interesting prophecies. The major ones in here that we would uh, want to look at is the three-headed eagle which is a prophecy of how Rome splits, divides, comes back, and then ends. And so the Roman Empire is not exactly over yet. It's in a lull at the moment, but, and it's got something to do with these, these things. So we'll stop there for tonight. The next week, we want to try to get back to our Enoch study, unless, of course, more happens with this, this war, and we'll see what happens. I did want to, one of our... Um, followers in our group uh, sent me the shirt. I just kind of wanted to show it to you. I, de I tend to say I like this and this is interesting. So they kind of sent this saying, very interesting, Dr. Ken Johnson. It's a quote. So thank you for that. It made us both smile. So it's really nice to, to see you guys care like that and do little things like that. Thank you to all of you that's been supporting us too. Um, I wanted to share one other thing with you. Here is our Bible Facts website. It's our main website. And if you go to the bookstore, that's where we have all of our books that you guys can buy. And I wanted to introduce one thing to you. Under Dead Sea Scroll Studies, we now have a new book, just came out this last week, called Ancient Prophecies from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so right now it's available in English. We will have an audio book and other stuff later. Um, so you can, these are all just links to Amazon. So, but I wanted to kind of introduce that to you for a second. Here is the book in general. And just to kind of show you what I wanted to do is we, well, let me back up here. We have, um, for dead, major Dead Sea Scroll prophecies, other than Enoch and Gad, we've got the Testaments of the Patriarchs. And their concept is that the Patriarchs all wrote a last will and testament which does contain prophecy in places. So very interesting for that. The calendar explains how they date things, which is really important for prophecy. And then the Damascus Covenant is their concept of the Messiah, uh, their doctrine, things like that, that uh, also helps. So now the 400 years is not silent anymore. Now this is, uh, minus the patriarchal writings, this is all their concepts of the prophetical parts so not you know commentaries of morality or anything but just the prophecies so in in that concept this is what we did we broke it up with uh, the history of the dead sea scrolls how are they were predicted to happen how they happen uh the essene calendar so we can get an idea of how to date things 
and then the basic belief system. And then we have prophetic commentaries. So what these are, there's not a whole lot to some of them, but basically um, like Isaiah. Uh, what did Isaiah say about Messiah, first coming, second coming? That's how we would interpret it. Did they interpret it the same way? And they did in a lot of times. There's a lot of prophecies about the Messiah. And this, like the others, it seems like a good 80% of all the extra biblical or the commentaries are all pointing to first coming prophecies, which is really neat because when we look at them compared to the New Testament, and this is way, way older than the old than the New Testament, doctrine is the same. They interpret Daniel the same way, the 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 10 nations, the seven headed kingdom, things like that. They'll tell you what they think it is. When we go to the church fathers, we see they interpret it the same way also, the first and second century church fathers. So that's just really interesting. So for the prophetic commentaries, we've got uh, some in Genesis about the Messiah, uh, uh, Psalms, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and Malachi. Most of them are very, very small, just fragments of them. Uh, the Habakkuk commentary is unique because we basically have all, I mean, almost all of chapter one and two. And that is very phenomenal. You know how where it says the just live by faith. Their commentary says that is faith in the Messiah and how he would save us. We don't save ourselves. So it's not a concept of God will do stuff, whatever that is. It's specifically faith in the Messiah and his death and atonement. And it's really interesting to see a lot of these other things in here. Uh, the, the Ezekiel commentary is a lot there, there's a specific commentary about the valley of dry bones and they talk about how it actually happens twice in, in the differences between it and we can see the difference between 537 bc and 1948 very fascinating for us to know for sure that the version we have in ezekiel is for our time period so chapters 36 and 37 are all about right now Almost all of that is fulfilled, but parts of it are still not. And when we get to 38 and 39, that's that upcoming war. So very, very interesting. So we've got all these commentaries. As far as I know, these are all the commentaries from the scrolls proper. So we have everything except what was found in Cave 12, which is still somewhat of a mystery. So those are the commentaries on the Old Testament prophets. And then we have basic prophecy studies. We've done videos on 11Q Melchizedek most fantastic Dead Sea Scroll of them all. Talks about how the Messiah came to die for our sins, to cleanse us and reconcile us to God. The event would happen one Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee of the eighth Una, which on their calendar, if you convert that to ours, it's 32 AD. Now, I'm not arguing, you know, give or take a year or whatever, but even getting it to around 30, give or take, is when this happens because we may not completely understand their calendar uh that's pretty amazing and that starts the age of grace and the destruction and the um there's several other prophecies in there a messianic apop apocalypse once you read it i think there's a good case to be built for that's what jesus is quoting in matthew 11. so very very interesting and then there's other things the katina actually is just a general explanation of things but it gives us a secret to how to interpret some of the messianic psalms and then there are fra smaller fragments there's one that talks about the messiah being the word that created everything just like in john 1 1 uh the elect one who comes in and and gives salvation for us our salvation hangs on the messiah uh, about the coming of elijah a commentary on enoch's 10 weeks again these are pretty small there's not a whole lot to them but just letting us know that. So apparently they they believed in Enoch's 10-week prophecy. That's pretty interesting. Uh, when Messiah comes the first time, the first coming, there won't be any more need for priests, more prophets. Thought that was interesting. We'll be able to go to the Lord ourselves and be led by the Holy Spirit. There's a study on ages. There's some sort of a plague that begins in Gaza. That's pretty interesting. Book of War. Things about the Messiah being the branch of David and other prophecies that he does. There's actually a prophecy of end time Nephilim medicine and things that come back. 
So again, this, that one surprised me because there's several prophecies about Nephilim and the flood uh, from the scrolls, and that's really ancient. This particular one is obviously way past the flood and goes up to the time of the, the second coming. So that's really interesting. Again, getting back to this, this Nephilim medicine we're supposed to stay away from. And then there's the thing about the teacher of righteousness. Everybody tries to say, we don't know who he is. They make it very clear. Teacher of righteousness is the Messiah. They quote all the um, the passages from Hosea and, and other places. So the Messiah actually is, is uh, the teacher of righteousness. There's a summary of the prophecies and the definitions are kind of important because we'll read of an idiom and we you read it and study it, you kind of get the general idea of what it means and that's good, but they'll give you sometimes an exact definition and it makes a world of difference. So I just wanted to kind of introduce that to you. So that's what is going on here. Now I will be at also the Prophecy Watchers Conference in June, the 27th to 30th in 2024, be talking about this book and going through some of those prophecies. So you can go to their website if you're interested in coming. It would be Colorado Springs again this June, so in the next couple of months. And I think that's it for here. So we'll go ahead and stop for tonight. I'll go to the chat room and see if there's any questions. Uh, prophecy is fascinating. I want to continue to um, want to continue to um, uh, get through. I want to get through Enoch. The the other stuff. There's some interesting prophecy parts we want to get into, and then we want to get back to a general understanding of prophecy and pull in some of these things. In that one one scroll in this set of books um, is that one date prophecy that I want to get to eventually. And so, uh, ah, Kenneth Johnson said, yeah, good evening. Wonderful name, by the way. So that's pretty cool. All right, let me, let's see here. Prophecy. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Let me get to my pinned comments. Here's my, here's our questions. There we go. Uh, okay, I became a member. Thank you very much. Glad that you're with us and can be in the chat room and and uh, hope we all have a chance to study prophecy and learn. Uh, Nine dollar American girl gave us a ten dollar donation. Basically, uh, thank you very much for helping out with with these things. Every little bit helps, and we really appreciate it. And then Isaiah gave a super sticker ten dollars. Um, let's see. All right. Thank you very much. And then Wolverine gifted five memberships. Thank you very much. Um, that's fantastic. And again, we really appreciate all this guy for you guys. Uh, Joyce became a member, Angel Level. That's fantastic. Thank you. Okay, question. I saw a past interview with Josh Peck discussing the Essenes predicting Apophis in 25 to 29. Have you discussed this before? And would Apophis be Wormwood? Well, something like Apophis will be Wormwood, or Wormwood will be something like that. Uh, it may or may not be that particular one. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's several things that, not in the scrolls, but there's several reasons throughout Scripture and other things, so just looking at things in general that kind of point to 2025 as a pivotal time. And the one of the interesting things is when you get through with the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, they have the dates. I mean, it's, it's very easy to find out what they, what they think, at least, is the date. So like right now, if we went to, um, let's just go here real quick. If we go to our DSS calendar today, on the, the regular modern Jewish calendar, it's 5784. Okay, on the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, it's 5949. So the year 6000 would be a pivotal date, may or may not be the second coming, but the current Pharisee calendar, the modern Jewish calendar, it would be 200 and some years away. According to this, it's less than 51 years away, uh, the, that date anyway. And that last 50-year period is a jubilee period, which is called a generation. And so the concept that the scrolls teach is that we're going to have a lot of prophecies in basically in the last two to three generations of every age, things begin. 
But in that last generation, a lot of prophecy happens. And that's why I've, I've speculated and I've said, I don't think much of anything's going to happen until another couple of years. And I was wrong, you know, with uh, the Gaza war and Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran. And Iran at this point hasn't been a major catastrophe as predicted, but the process has started for the first time. So again, it's pretty interesting for that. Um, so in this case, uh, I was approached by him because I'm saying that 2025 and, you know, is the Jubilee year. And after that begins the last generation, according to these scrolls. Now, is that the same thing that Jesus mentioned? I don't know. Uh, it seems like it would be, but again, I, I don't want to not speculate because somebody might misquote me and say I'm date setting. Uh, and, and if they set a date, I definitely want to tell you about it. Uh, like, for instance, um, there's the Jehovah Witness cult, and they have uh, set dates for the return, uh, I think, five or six times over the last century. Last time, I think, was like 82, 1982. Um, and so now they say, well, we didn't really do that. It's different and et cetera. So, but it's written. I mean, it's written in the newspapers and all over. So point being, I can tell you there's a there's a newspaper article setting the date by this group for here. Now, obviously they were wrong, but still that's a thing. I'm not speculating. I'm just telling you what is written. So if there's something in the scrolls, be it right or wrong, we would want to look at it. So far, unless I'm missing something, everything in the scrolls have been 100% accurate. And again, all the extra information about the first coming prophecies, that's pretty, pretty amazing. So if all of that is is accurate what about this other stuff so um but apophis apparently is on a i believe it's a seven year cycle so if it doesn't do anything in 25 to 29 it may seven years later or 14 years later or 21 years later so that in a case i think is pretty interesting and it does seem to hit the middle of cycles so if it keeps up a seven-year Shemitah type cycle or seven and a half or something like that, um, it might actually be Wormwood sometime. I doubt 2025 because we'd have to be, uh, assuming Wormwood is in the middle, and that's somewhat debatable. It's in the tribulation somewhere. But we haven't started the tribulation period yet. Rapture hasn't happened. So there's no way we could get to, you know, four years into the tribulation period in one and a half years so 25 is out 29 might be depending on how it works and if not again something like that happens if it's not wormwood it's something or not uh, apophis rather it's something like it but remember we're seeing a lot of these scrolls talking about the fact of a uh, many signs in the atmosphere so that could just be one sign and wormwood takes out one third of the earth's waters. So if we had some Apophis or something hit that destroyed maybe a 10th of the water, that wouldn't be it, but that would be a precursor of what's coming. So there's lots of things like that to look at. What do Jewish rabbis say about the 70th week prophecy in Daniel? Uh, most of them say that it's a future time period. The Talmud says this actually. And it relates it to the time of Jacob's trouble. And it also talks about, I, I think it's kind of interesting in there or unique in there in the Talmud that it talks about, you know, we have the marriage supper of the lamb. There is in the Talmud circles, I don't know if it's anywhere else, but in the Talmud, they talk about the feast of Leviathan. And Leviathan is their name for a seven-headed red dragon which represents some sort of evil empire in the last days. So it, it, to me, I thought that was really interesting because that's not biblical uh, what well, the dragon is, but as far as it being called Leviathan and all that is unique to that manuscript or to the Talmud rather. Um, so they're saying that there is a evil empire, which is looked at as a seven headed red dragon and if they're not talking about Revelation, I'd love to see what they're talking about, a seven-headed red dragon, uh, in what piece of literature. 
but it represents the time of Jacob's trouble and the uh, the feast of Leviathan. And the idea of the feast of Leviathan is when the animals under Leviathan's control are eating people. Okay, so if there's any truth to that, that throws us back to Amos and Joel and Revelation about the time when the animals attack. I think that's the fifth seal in Revelation. So again, it's really interesting. Um, you can always find a rabbi that disagrees with this, and you can always find a, a Christian pastor that disagrees with what's going on now or prophecy in general. But as far as what's written, they seem to be pretty accurate. So it's a very cool thing to study. Again, that doesn't give us any more information, but it just helps us to understand that anciently, everybody interpreted it the same way. Any thoughts about the U.S. universities having to shut down because of the violence to Jewish students? Um, oh, thoughts on it. We always have that kind of stuff during a war. And it's, to me, it's a pattern that keeps reoccurring. Um, you, you had it during World War II. You had, and not just Jews, but whoever were fighting against or, or helping or whatever, Vietnam War. You know, remember we came back and they said the, the, we were baby killers and all this stuff. Well, war is war and we all know what happened. Um, so things like that happen. So right now there is a uh, war between Hamas and Israel. So you're either saying don't know, don't care, or you're going to be on Israel's side or Hamas's side or Islam or whatever. So you've got all these things. Remember, the concept is as a Christian or a Jew, we think Messiah is going to come or come back and then he's going to take care of everything. Whether he forgives people, slaughters people, whatever, he's fixing stuff. OK, and we may help him at that time, but he's the one doing it. Uh, and the Sunni Muslims would teach that same way, too. We'll just wait till Mahdi comes and then he'll fix stuff. So most religions have that concept of an end times, a great war, but somebody will come and fix stuff. Shia Islam, though, on the other hand, believes that they have to start the process. And so there's always this extreme, it, it, it's not even really hatred per se, but it's like an extreme, this is my command. What God wants me to do is to go kill people. Um, and so not even all Shias, I should say, but this is the kind of thing that's going on. So in this case, um, you and I would usually back down and say, I don't want to get involved. God will take care of it. That's kind of our mindset. Their mindset is uh, Allah will take care of it through me. And so the violence kind of comes and goes. But we also had that with Vietnam um, and all the other wars that we've had, there's always things like that. Um, people trying to say we shouldn't be involved. In World War II, we had kind of the same things. People were picketing, saying, let Hitler do whatever he wants to with Europe, uh, Germany for Hitler, um, United, United States for Americans, just stay out of it, uh, that kind of a thing. And so whether that's right or wrong, that's always a sentiment. Of course, we know what happened in World War II. We know it's part of the prophecies. So we know what happened as, as, as it was supposed to. So, yeah, I would just say be careful. Um, you should be able to put on something that says, I'm a Christian, I'm Calvary Chapel, I'm Jewish, I'm this, I'm that, and just go about your business. And then if I'm, you know, there, it's like, you're one of those. Hey, tell me about it. It should be a witnessing thing. And if you're right, you should be able to convince me and convert me. And that's what free speech is all about. Uh, the violence in that case is never right. So, for instance, though, there's no pro-Muslim, pro-Hamas, pro-Jew, pro-Israel person over here that has anything to do with the war over there. But still, violence is always something that's bad. That's why we have freedom of speech laws, we have the right to sue, that's why we carry weapons to protect ourselves. You know, if everybody knew everybody was armed, everybody would be okay, would calm down. But those are just things to think about. Um, this may blow, if there's no further thing with Iran at this time, 
that may not be a thing. Hamas will still be a thing for a while. Um, so we'll see what happens. I mean, we know what the prophecies say, but it may be quite a while before they come to fruition or not. Um, but we all need to be able to go to universities and study. So we just need to be careful of that kind of stuff. The safest thing is to go dress just like an, if you're in America as an American or somewhere else, however they dress and just go do your stuff and come back. I remember my supervisor, I used to work for Sprint, came in one time and he said, well, there's Muslims, there's been some complaints. What, what, are, what, are, what How do you feel about witnessing and stuff like that? And I said, well, my attitude is I'm here to make money and we're here to do a job. And I think everybody knows I'm a Christian. So if they want to ask a question, I will be more than happy to stop, talk to them. Well, not on company time, but you know, meet with them, whatever, and tell them my beliefs and what Christians do and things like that. And if they don't want to know, don't like it, they can not ask. You know, and he's like, okay, that's good. And, uh, but, you know, a complaint had come up and it's like, well, you got to look at the complaints, right? You can come and ask me what do Christians believe? Or you could say those blankety blank Christians. Either way, that's a comment that I by my religion am supposed to respond to so you know if i'm causing a problem let's find out where the problem is coming from and let's you know i'll try to be nice but i can't not respond when someone makes a comment or asks a question and my supervisor was like hey that makes perfect sense to me you might get in trouble but it makes sense to me and it's like well it is what it is so i don't work there anymore by the way so, but the Lord had other plans for me. I'm, I'm thinking you guys are glad that I'm here. But yeah, we got to be real careful of that. It's always a question of conscience, I think, of whether or not we should or should not witness, when should we witness, how we should witness. But we definitely want to be safe. So, is that the unfolding of Daniel 8? I'm not sure what is exactly. Daniel 8 is um, the prophecies. I have to go back and look. 7 and 8. Yeah, okay. Uh, 8 is the ram and the goat. Uh, so that anciently is about Persia and Greece and those empires that were back then. However, a lot of those things have a bearing on end time prophecy. And I'm not even saying that they represent the things that are now and it's happening again, which is a possibility, a reoccurring prophecy. But there's some pieces to it that mean something. So not sure exactly. Well, we'll find out. It seems like um, now in the prophecy, the ram is Persia, which would be Iran, and the goat is Greece. So if there's something that happens again, there could be a connection with that. Be something to watch and look for. But even if that doesn't happen, there still may be things in, in Daniel 7 and 8 that are for our time period. Super Chat, $20. Really appreciate your ministry. God bless you and your family. Thank you very much. Uh, we I really appreciate all you guys being here. And it's glad to know that we're helping people when people ask questions or you know, different things, and we get a even a thank you or whatever. It's it's just nice to know that it helped. Uh, became a member, an angel. Thank you very much. Glad you're here. Is there any chance that one of Noah's sons' wives were the descendants of the fallen angels and the giants? It doesn't seem like it because in the manuscripts, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, like Enoch and a few others, it's, and, you know, it could always be translated wrong, especially since Enoch is Hebrew to Giaz to English, and you lose a lot in the translation, even if it was done perfectly. But it seems to indicate that that stuff was wiped out. There are no Nephilim beings that made it through the flood, except for that one prophecy that says something made it through the flood. But that could be beings a different way. Uh, the technology for how to make Nephilim, which we know definitely made it through the flood and was reinstituted in Canaan. That's the reason why you have post-flood giants. We haven't talked about that in the Enoch series, but we will this summer go through a post-flood 
Nephilim study, which I think will be interesting. Uh, I don't believe that is the case. I think Noah, his three sons, and his three sons' wives were all uh, genetically pure. So it says that Noah was pure. Uh, he married his aunt, I think it is, Nema. Uh, so they were pure. Of course, if they're both pure, their three and their three sons were pure. And it talks about the three daughters of the three sons were the three daughters of Eliakim, who's another uncle kind of thing. So everything is in inside this, this family structure. So this is the last part. And it also talks about right before the flood, everyone who was a believer in the Lord died peacefully in those days. And the only ones that were left that were believers were Noah, Nema, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their three wives. And uh, there are some records, supposedly, around of some. Japheth's wife left a uh, an interesting testament, if you will. I've never seen it. I've heard about it. But again, I'd like to get it translated. Um, but um, so I don't think so. I could be wrong. But there are a lot of other things that something made it through the flood, according to one of the manuscripts. And then one of the others seemed to indicate no actual angels made it through or Nephilim. So it, it seems more like, I don't know. It's a good question. I don't think we can really say definitive on that. Something made it through. And when we get to the second coming, it's going to be as in the days of Noah, which you could say just means marrying and giving in marriage and not caring. But I think we all know it means more than that, connecting it with Daniel 2 and other places. Question, I'm confused about Passover. Wasn't Passover the day Jesus was crucified? Yes. I know there are messed up there are, are messed up things with all calendars, but I guess I've confused when Pe Pentecost would be then. Let's look at it real quick. Let me just run this up because this calendar replicates. It's the same every year. Every year it starts on a Wednesday, the first year, New Year's is, so it's always the same. And the way they do it, and they may be right, they may be wrong. Like you're saying, there's there's probably ca problems with all calendars. Even if this is the perfect God-ordained calendar, I may have something garbled in it. But um, yeah, the way this works is the first of Nisan comes. On the 14th, it's the the uh, preparation day of the Passover. And the manuscript or the, the New Testament Gospels tell us that's when Jesus died. So it's the 14th. Now, we're also told that a day starts in the evening. So the 14th is Tuesday night at sundown, and it goes through Wednesday to Wednesday at sundown. So what we're going to see here is that on Passover, the 14th, Jesus had a Passover Seder Tuesday night, went to the garden, was arrested. The next day he was put on trial and then crucified, and that's uh, Wednesday morning. And they talked about they have to hurry up and get him off the cross uh, before the High Holy Day. The High Holy Day is the first day of unleavened bread. And pre Passover day is the preparation day for the week of Passover. Or the week of unleavened bread, rather. Sometimes it's called the week of Passover back then. So anyway, so he would be crucified and put in an airtight tomb before Wednesday night, before sundown. So he's in there for three days and three nights. So that's Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday. So sometime after sundown on Saturday night, he arose. So when you go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that when they went to find him, it was on the first day of the week, and he was already resurrected. So on the Pharisee calendar, first fruits is that very next Sunday. On the Sadducee calendar, the first fruits is the day after the high Sabbath. That's Thursday. And none of us believe that one. They're looking at it as the Sabbath is the the uh, this Sunday after Passover week. So instead of 19th, it would be 26th. So this one here. And then as far as that goes, however you, you point it, the scripture talks about from first fruits plus 50 days is um pentecost so if you start here with first fruits and you go you know a set of weeks one two three four five six seven weeks and then you come to pentecost sunday all the first fruit festivals on this calendar are on sundays and 
So this is the first fruits is actually first fruits of the barley harvest. Pentecost is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then 50 days past Pentecost is another Sunday festival, which is first fruits of new wine. That's the uh, grape harvest, grape juice and wine. And then 50 days later from that is first fruits of new oil, which is the olive olive oil. So the first fruits of the olives. Then you've got the wood offerings for the following year, and then the high holy days begin. And that's the way they have it in here. So everything is different. Now this year, uh, we'd have to look and see, but this year, um, Resurrection Sunday would have been April 7th. Uh, Passover would have been April 2nd. And I think we have to go back and look, but um, I have to look at it and see here. Yeah, where'd it go? Let me just exit out of some of these. Okay, there we go. So, okay, here we are. So, again, I think, well, I'd have to look at it and see. Right now, it's it's on the Jewish date. It's the 15th. So, if I remember correctly, I'll get there back. Okay. So, the 15th. Yeah, this is Monday. So, I'm thinking Passover on the modern Jewish calendar is either next Monday or the following Monday. It varies. What happens is the Gregorian calendar tries to keep everything uh, connected with the summer, or the spring equinox, uh, give or take a day. So it tries to be really accurate, but that makes our weeks off. If I was to ask you when New Year's is, you'd say it's January 1st, but it's on a different day of the week every time. So, you know, it's kind of messed up. So with, the, with uh, this calendar, the weeks are synced, um, but the modern Jewish calendar goes by a lunar cycle. So that a new, the first day of a new month has to be a new moon. So they can be up to two weeks off from the, act, from the actual date. This one is based on a leap week system. So it can be off up to two and a half days or three days, basically. Uh, before it switches. You can get three days forward or three days backwards, but if it's outside of that time period, you add a week and you stay within three days of the equinox. So it's it's a really amazing system. Don't know for sure if it's the original. They say it's the original. They were prophets. I like their prophecies, so it, it kind of makes sense. There's a lot of interesting things now. We're beginning to plug these prophecies and the things that happened on the dates that are now fact, like last week's, or, or the Hamas, Hamas war and stuff like that, the date that they, on this calendar compared to others, really interesting studies. Hopefully that's a little, little better. It's, it's really confusing, I think, because number one, we've got Gregorian calendar, modern Jewish calendar, Dead Sea Scroll calendar. So it's three of them. The Dead Sea Scroll calendar works a couple of different ways. It's actually used in, in language a couple of different ways. So that's confusing. And then if you're trying to figure out if Muslims are attacking, they're going to be using their own calendar. So that's a, a Islamic calendar. So you really have five or six calendars. So it's, it's, it, that makes it really, really confusing, which I think is designed by somebody to do that. But hopefully that helps. Um, how can we access the pages you have put together noting the specific dates for various historical events. Oh, okay. That's, um, if you go to the website, the Dead Sea Scroll, my main website is biblefacts.org. And of course, there's a link to it. If we go, if we just go back here, here's what we're doing and everything. And there's a link to the DSS calendar, or you could just go to dsscalendar.org. This is the main site. And there are what's called ONA studies. And when you click on them, Basically, their, their concept is there's supposed to be 7,000 years between the Genesis creation, Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, and the creations of a new heaven and a new earth after the millennial reign. It should be 7,000 years. And I'm not going to try to prove or disprove that. That's just their theology. So if you take 7,000 years and break it into what they call onas, 500-year periods, there are 14 of them. Now, each una is 10 jubilees, 10 times 50 is 500 years. And then each jubilee is seven shemitahs in a jubilee year, that kind of stuff. 
So in here, this is, we're, we're in process of doing this. This has been up a while. I really need to rewrite this because there's a little bit of problems with the coding. Um, I'm, I'm fairly good, but I'm not that good. But like, for instance, right now we're in the 12th owner. It's almost over. So we're getting close to year 6,000, which is 50, 5,501 to 6,000. So it's under ONA studies. Click under which ONA. And then we'll have from 5,500 to the year 6,000. So that's from 1576 all the way to 2075 when the age of grace ends. So, um, and we've got the Gaza war that was back here and there's other things like that we're trying to pull up. So we're trying to make these available. And I thought this is probably the best way to do it because remember how I said there's two different versions kind of of the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. One of them is just dated. It's the year 5949. Okay, we're done. But another way of doing it is it's the certain year of the certain Shemitah of a certain Jubilee of a certain Una of a certain age. And that's really complicated. And it's and it gets really, to me, it's confusing. It's like when Adam was created and say it's just it's the very first day of creation. And it's, Adam has been here for five minutes, you know. Well, that's the first day of the first year of the first uh, Shemitah, of the first Jubilee, of the first owner of the first age. And that's how the clock goes. And you're thinking like, he's only been here five minutes, but that's just like really confusing. We do the same thing though when we talk about centuries. It was the, um, the King James Bible was written in 1611, right? That's the 17th century. It's like, no, it's the 16th century. No, the year one to the year 99 or 100, for instance, is the first century. 100 begins the second century. So it's like, okay, I got to wrap my, my, my head around that. So it does get pretty confusing. But this is what we tried to do. It's nowhere near complete, but we're trying to put these things together. So I hope that helps. Why do so many people think America has to not exist or not help Israel when Ezekiel 38 20 says, I will call for a sword against Gog and Magog on my mountains? Apparently, someone is helping Israel. Yeah, I think that's God directly because it talks about fire coming down, although he could be using others like that. It is weird, though, because Ezekiel 38, and again, Anything future, technically speculation, so I could be wrong. But the way I'm reading it, it's very specific. Um, first, it says that there's a group of people that attack Israel. And then there's Israel. And then there's, there's this group of people that's on Israel's side that either help or don't help. One is Saudi Arabia. They flipped by that time. The other one is Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is thought of to be Spain or England or maybe something else. But in the prophecies in Isaiah, it talks about uh, when Israel comes back the second time, the ships of Tarshish are the ones that bring them. Well, the Balfour Declaration or the commission to create a Palestine, a Jordan, or divide it up, however, state for Israel, was given to England, not Spain. So we know from that prophecy that Tarshish is England or Great Britain. And then it talks about the, the cubs of Tarshish. And everybody says, okay, well, that doesn't mean a whole lot because who's a cub of Tarshish? Pro almost everybody. I mean, United States, Great uh, South Africa, um, um, Canada, different things like that. But the way the language is, I think it's pretty specific. It's not just like the cubs in general, however many cubs it had. It's talking about a specific group. So there's a group of cubs that help Tarshish do things. So if Africa is Africa, Mexico is Mexico, Canada is Canada, the United States is the only united set of states. We had 13 colonies to begin with, and now we're 50 states, which by legal definition in the Constitution, we're 50, a state is the same thing as a country. So there's actually the country, I live in Kansas next to Missouri, so there's the country of Kansas, the country of Missouri. If we had a problem, we theoretically could go to war. We're, we're individual, but we submit to a 
um, federal government to pull us together so we have strength. Uh, so that's the way it's supposed to work. So the point being is when this war happens, there is England or Great Britain, which seems to be a separate thing, and at least one of its its cub groups is with it, and it's a group of cubs. The only group of cubs is the United States. So the way I'm looking at that, and you could look at it differently. I'm not saying it's it's a guaranteed thing, but just looking at the language, it's Great Britain. We know from the prophecy of Isaiah 660 or 61. Uh, and then it's not just cubs in general, it's a specific group of cubs that are a thing. And that ha that would have to be United States. So we definitely exist. So there's no way that we get nuked and totally destroyed before this happens anyway. I think it's amazing. I I've had friends uh, that I know of or acquaintances that have said, well, uh, Trump or Biden or whom whomever was there at the time, uh, the president of the United States is the Antichrist. And we are Babylon and Russia is going to nuke us. And I'm thinking like there is flat no way one of those could be true, but they can't all happen. The Antichrist pulls together 10 nations to attack and destroy Babylon. If he can do that, he's in control of his nation. You don't ask someone to come in and destroy your nation that you're under that you have under your control. That's just not a thing. We could be Babylon. But then the president's not the Antichrist. If the president's the Antichrist, we are definitely not Babylon. Okay. And if we are Babylon, we don't get destroyed until the middle of the tribulation period. So there's no way Russia can nuke us right now. So, and I'm not saying any of that's true. I'm just saying they can't all be true. And you just got to pull these together. So we exist whenever this happens. Some people think that this is uh at, at the end of the trip before the trip and i'm not really sure but whenever this happens we apparently are still doing okay we haven't been nuked yet and we're there and it looks like we oppose what russia does but we may, may or may not get involved in it and i think the main thing is that it talks about god sends a fire on russia and those that invade and that sounds like he intervenes directly like we don't do anything and they do. Another way of looking at it has been that we send a nuclear missiles, they send nuclear missiles, and in which case United States and um, NATO and Russia may all be kind of eliminated or at least decimated to the point that they're not a force in the next three or five years or seven years. And then that creates a vacuum. Well, however it happens, it creates a vacuum of power over there where 10 nations rise up. So, and then Russia is connected with the Roman Empire in a certain way. So there's a lot of other little prophecies that we're not exactly sure of yet. But these Dead Sea Scrolls are giving us clues. But that's a really good question. We, there's a lot of people that take one thing and then just run with it. Like when they talk to me about uh, the, the tribulation has started. I think I mentioned this a minute ago, tribulation has started, so there must be a post-trib rapture or whatever. Okay, well, forget the rapture, but if the tribulation has started, why do we still have a Nile River? That's just one prophecy among, I think there's 10 of them that I pulled out that happen immediately, and it's like, yeah, we're not there yet. Question, BRICS nations alignment, is it or is it found in prophecy? Um, some people are thinking it's connected because there are 10 nations. I think those are actually 10 nations, although BRICS are nations. Um, this is a group of nations that are trying to control through finance rather than through war. So it might have something to do with it. Um, again, it's, I'm not sure if it's could fit. It might fit. We'd have to wait and see. For the longest time, a lot of us in Calvary Chapel thought that the United uh, European Common Market in Europe was it because it started off with 10. And so 10 nations, you know, but it turns out that it, it got a lot more than 10 nations. And then the founding, one of the founding members, England, breaks off. So it's just not there. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't reconstitute and then it ends up being that. But we're looking, the prophecies we're looking for uh, empires 
We're looking for 10 nations. We're looking for a guy who's the king of a country north of Israel, being the Antichrist. And Egypt is involved in all of these wars and Israel. So there's certain things that have to be focused on that kind of stuff. So if they are in prophecy, it's just because there's 10 of them. And that's that's the idea now. So if they went from five, three to five to 10 and then went to 15 to 20, probably not. Do you have any references to what exact what the early church services looked like? Uh, standard prayers. There are some things like that. Um, and we have a book called Ancient Church Fathers, and that'll give you a little bit of that kind of stuff. Uh, but they talked about how uh, they don't pray to the dead. They don't uh, pray with a certain bodily position. So you don't have to go in there and do this. And, you know, that's kind of stuff that happened in the, the Middle Ages and apparently was kind of happening back then. And we have Gnostics that taught all sorts of weird things. And so that helps with them saying, no, no, Christians don't do that. So they talked about they, they did get baptized. Uh, the concept was that you confess your you know, confess that you are a Christian and then they watch you for six months or maybe more. Usually you want to get baptized in the summer, um, not in the winter, especially if you're up north. But they'd watch you for around six months or so to make sure that you are a believer and you're walking the walk. And then if you are a Christian, you prove yourself, you know, by your works that way, then they baptize you. So they recognize that baptism has nothing to do with salvation. It's just a dedication once you've gotten that far, apparently you really are a Christian. Um, and so they talk a lot about stuff like that. They um, each group of Christians dressed and ate, uh, dressed however they dressed in their country, and they ate the food that they ate in that country. So like, for instance, I would say someone from Scotland where it wears, wears a kilt. And somebody from another country might say, why is a man wearing a dress? That's just weird. It's not a dress. That's just what they do over there. And so it was that kind of a thing that was interesting. Do they drink alcohol? Some groups do, some don't. Do they eat uh, pork? Some groups do, some. So none of that applies. You you do the, the actions, the dress, the food in the country that you're at. And it said one thing, though, is that they never have abortions. You'll never see a Christian having an abortion because that's considered murder. Uh, there's other places that talk about the fact that when they decided they wanted to start persecuting Christians because of that, it's really hard to find a Christian because they don't dress funny. So here's a guy walking down the street and he's dressing like everybody else. He's eating everything, everybody else. So I can't really, you know, here, I'm going to force you to eat pork. A Christian would be like, ah, oh, cool, pork, you know, so that didn't work. So one of the things that they were talking about is that what you do is they have a church service on Sunday morning. So you wait to the first day of the week when most people are working, uh, except for Christians, sun worshipers, and you know a few other groups. But if there is a house somewhere and a bunch of people go to it, and then they come out of the house, and if you happen to walk by and smell if, it's, if every one of them had a slight smell of alcohol, then that means they had communion. So Sunday morning, all together, private place, a little bit of alcohol, that's going to be a Christian group. So then you target that house and try to start arresting people. So it's really interesting to kind of see all that stuff. Uh, so food and dress didn't really matter uh, at that point. So... I mean, there is the question of head coverings in 1 Corinthians. We still don't completely understand that. But um, so church services, it talked about um, uh, whatever that, that place did. So back in the day, most places would have the men study, the women and children stay at home so they don't cause confusion or interruption. Or if it's a big synagogue, sometimes the ladies will be in the back. Some synagogues um, had uh, women on one side, guys on the other, and that's normally not what Christians did. Families were to, if, if the family was there, the family stayed together. So there's a lot of little things. If you have any specific question on did they or did they not do a certain thing, 
let me know and I'll either know or we could probably research it. Do you have every, oh, uh, do you have any references to what exactly the church services look like as far as prayers, uh, liturgy format, prayers, communion, around 100 AD? Let's see. Um, 100 AD would be pretty sparse. Most of my stuff would be probably between 150 and 200. That's when you have most of the things that are written that still exist. So um, in the first century, we have the Didache, we have the Testament of our Lord, and it seems like there's one other, oh, Barnabas, Epistle of Barnabas, that's companion of Paul. Those still exist, and those give us a good indication of things in general. Barnabas no normally just focused on typological prophecy, but it does have some stuff like that in there. Then when you get to the, the second century, you have mainly Polycarp and Irenaeus. And then um, the second half, you've got a, a, a few more people, Thinagorius, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, things like that. And that's when you get like a ton of writing. They basically, as far as I can tell, teach the same thing until you get up in the 300s. Then things get really weird. Um, Clement of Alexandria, on the other hand, taught some strange things. So most of the time, the early guys all taught the same thing. So, yeah, um, like I said, communion was wine and bread. Uh, one of the things there was a, where there was a cult called the Incratites, and they, they taught that drinking alcohol was a sin. So they refused to take communion with Christians. And uh, they had this weird ritual, instead of using bread, I could see the wine being a sin, you know, drunkenness, bread, I don't get, but they, they changed it. So it's not bread and wine. It was cheese and milk. I have no clue why, but that's just what they did. But they refused communion with or to fellowship with regular Christians that followed those rituals. So there's a whole bunch of stuff like that. And as far as prayers, they didn't have any set times. They didn't have any set bodily positions. And they always prayed to the Father in the name of Jesus. They refused to pray to saints or angels or anything like that. So, pretty interesting. One of, one of the things that they mentioned, there's a lot of different Gnostic cults, and they basically all have basic Gnosticism. But each one had some oddball thing that only they did. And so when they were listing the cults, they would show you the oddball things. One of them was a cult called the Incratites. And the Incratites had small statues or idols that you could carry in your coat or your purse or something like that with you. Uh, Jesus, Michael the Archangel, I think Pythagoras, and a handful of other people that they liked. So in other words, dead people. And that was considered odd among Gnostics. They kind of said prayers for the dead, but they were the first ones to have those little idols. And that was completely forbidden as far as Christians goes. Lactanus, who's more like 240-ish, I think, 250, uh, talked about making prayers for the dead as an unforgivable right and a violation of sacred law. And people who do such things will pay for their impiety. I mean, he was really, really fiery with that. So there is enough stuff to, to get an idea of, of how they did that. But everything was done in love as far as the Christians are concerned. One of the things that they, would, they knew we're Christians by our love for each other. We would just flat refuse to participate and if it was something pagan. And Lord bless you, but you, we, you should stop that too. And that, that's as far as it would go. Excommunicate you because you don't bring that in here. Um, but the Gnostics, the Incratites, were known to be very hostile, very uh, angry. So like the, one of the questions earlier was this process of... Um, in the, in the uh, colleges, this hatred, the picketing and stuff like that, that would not be something the early Christians would do. They'd all be out, they might picket per se, stand out there, sing songs to the Lord, hold up a sign, you shouldn't be doing this or whatever. But there wouldn't be any, you wouldn't be able to detect any anger. That's not something that Christians should do. We have a bunch of really good questions tonight. Question off topic. What are your thoughts on the discoveries of Ron Wyatt, Noah's Ark, Red Sea Crossing, 
Mount Sinai Christ crucifixion site where the Ark of the Covenant was underneath based on his blood. A lot of that stuff, as far as Ron Wyatt's concerned, I can't really prove him right or prove him wrong. Some of it sounds plausible. Some of it sounds strange to me. So I don't really have an opinion on Ron Wyatt. Um, I had heard that he was a Seventh-day Adventist or had worked with him and then kind of went uh, non-Trinitarian Noahide. Uh, so that makes me wonder, you know, that kind of stuff. If you deny the Trinity, if you deny certain basic ideas that an angel would come and talk to you about that and not correct your theology. So it, it, it sounds weird, but you know, I don't know for sure. Question, do you think the recent natural gas found off the coast of Israel could be the blessing of oil that Asher dips his foot in? I think it definitely could be part of it. Um, some people have said that that is the food, like the oil from the uh, olives, you know, exports and stuff like that. Since it it's, could be an end time prophecy, it um, makes more sense to think oil like we would use it for that. In other words, you would make much more with oil natural gas and petroleum oil than you would olives although over there they grow a lot of stuff too so it could be either or but natural gas is not a thing but natural gas occurs where there's oil so in that case we have um it, it's definite possibility if they found natural gas which they have and they're actually selling that now um, and that could cause problems in war situations but they should be able to find actual oil there too. And some people have said they have. I don't know how far that's went or if it's real or not, but they're working on it. Uh, part one, part one of four. Okay, she did. Okay, I see. Okay, it seems the mere presence of Jesus just arriving at the temple at his second coming would cleanse the temple since he's the perfect sacrifice, better than a red heifer. Oh, amen to that. Um, the thing that everybody's looking at with the red heifer, though, is the Jews are back in their land. They've redid a priesthood. They're redoing the sacrifices. So they may or may not even do the sacrifices right and the preparations and all. So it's, it's been so long. I don't know if they really know for sure how to do things. But it, it's not that it's necessary uh, it's just a prophecy of what would happen. God doesn't want any of the wars to happen, but he's simply telling us, if you want to know in advance, there'll be a war here. Jews will come back here. This will happen. That will happen. This is a good one. This is a bad one. But this is how it folds out, just so that we know. So we should never look at prophecies as something that we could pray away. Or, you know, like a lot of us pray, Lord, make the rapture hurry up. Well, it's kind of set in stone, and I don't know when it is, but I, I still do that. It's like, can you please hurry? But it's not going to. He's not going to answer that prayer. It's going to happen when it happens. So, but as far as like real holiness, yes, Christ being there would fix it, I would think. And it, we can kind of see that because you're supposed to stay away from like lepers, and he would go up and touch them and heal them. Well, you know. Technically, he's unclean. Now he's Messiah. He cleanses everything. So that's a really good point. Um, Daniel 8, 13, and 14 seems to say that the 2300 starts with the start of the daily sacrifice, including the abomination of desolation, and ends when the temple is cleansed. Yeah, I'm thinking that it goes past the second coming, just my opinion, but I'm thinking it goes past the second coming. I think the 1335 is when we can start the kingdom and they may la may put a um, um, cornerstone there to begin, you know, and cleanse it and all that. But then it's going to take some time to do build the temple. And I'm thinking however long that is, 2300 days later, uh, from the mi middle part is actually when the temple will be finished and dedicated. That, that's my guess. It might be something else, but that's kind of what I'm thinking too. So if the 2300 ends at the second coming, then the 2300 starts seven months and 10 days after the tribulation begin. 
seems like like enough time to rebuild the temple maybe or not the temple per se but or not the millennial temple but the tribulation temple that could be too and that's yeah see i kind of looked at it the other way but if it is that way then i think either way the ending or beginning marks something so you're talking about a few days into the tribulation something happens or a few days after the tribulation something happens so again not sure exactly how but that would be a good one to uh, to work on to try to figure out do you think the 2300 days could start when the daily sacrifices start continue through the abomination and desolation and end at the second coming that could be yeah that very well could be um yeah maybe like i say it's got to be something like that this and that's the that's a good guess because those are the main things as far as the temple are concerned the construction of the temple the sacrifices beginning and then in the middle of the tribulation that it, it's stopping so those are major not that they're important again but they are major prophesied things that we look for so it could be fifty dollars um donation thank you very much from a secret admirer thank you very much we really appreciate that when paul talks about eating food offered to idols in first corinthians 8 and 9 his advice is that love must be the basis when he talks about the head covering in chapter 11 he sounds legalistic what are your thoughts yeah it's it's i'm not sure what the head covering is and there's several good theories. Number one is that men covered their head in the synagogues uh, to show they're under the covenant of Moses. And it has something to do with, even as he talked about the Moses veiled his face, you know, so you wouldn't see the glory going down. So the, a veil on the head with the face could indicate that. And that's why um, I love Messianic brothers, but I have a really funny feeling going to a messianic service and putting on a keppa now a keppa is middle ages it, it started in the middle ages so that's I, I definitely not what call, paul is talking about but the keppa started because they used to cover their heads and they wanted a way to walk around in public and not look jewish so they wouldn't get persecuted i think that's how it started so if you have a small keppa here and then you put a hat on nobody would know that your head's covered religiously like that but it has to do something with that ancient time period now if it has nothing to do with that at all the question would be the head covering it's related to the angels so it could be related to marriage it could be related to authority to the covenant it could be several things or several things together one of the things that i've noticed in uh, the ancient times and this is not jewish law but Je old noahide gentile law is uh, um, they used to not have like a ketubah, like a, a, a marriage license, uh, but they would just kind of shack up. It would be a uh, common law marriage, okay? And the lady would cover her head so that you know she's married. Much like today, you, you go out and you see this nice girl and you're going to ask her for a date. The first thing you do is you kind of look to see if she's wearing a wedding ring. If she is, leave her alone, you know? And maybe she's wearing a wedding ring because she's not married, but she wants to be left alone. So it's kind of the same thing. And they were saying that if there's a lady with her head covered and all of a sudden she appears in the marketplace, just out in the public shopping with her head uncovered, she's either left the husband, been divorced, been widowed, something. And she's ready to start dating again, that kind of thing. So if you see someone without that, then you know you can approach them and talk to them. Um, so that's old Gentile law. And that may or may not have anything to do with 1 Corinthians 11. I've tried to research it a lot of times. There's several books on women and head coverings and things like that from the early church fathers. And when I read them, I'm still uh, lost. So... I'm not really sure what that is. The one thing I know for sure is if it was really that important, it would be clear. Now, the closest thing I can think of, and one of my theories on this, 
is I was reading the Epistle of Polycarp. And in the Epistle of Polycarp, he talks about the fact that Christians should be becoming. And that sounded strange at, at first, but you may have heard people say, you know, you look at somebody and say, that looks very unbecoming. And they usually mean it's too risque, it looks bad, or it's occultic, it looks like occultic jewelry. Usually it just means that you look horrible. Go change, go put on something prettier or something. Uh, that dress looks ugly is usually the way we use it. It's not very becoming or very uh, modest. Sometimes it's used that way. Um, but he was talking about in general everything. And so I shouldn't wear, I could wear a, a, a necklace with a pendant on it, you know, or whatever. Uh, like a cross or something that would show you that I'm a Christian. But if it looked like some other pagan religion, just kind of looked like it, then it would confuse people. So we don't want to wear that, you know, that kind of thing. And in the process of doing that, he was talking about how he compared to the fact that it's extremely important that we dress and act becomingly. And he quotes a couple passages in Paul, which is really interesting. And then he pulls in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, which talks about the homosexual and the effeminate, which would be like a gender fluid cross-dressing type person. And the concept that he meant was, I could be having an affair, homosexual or heterosexual, either one. And if I hit it real well, you'd never know it. But I can't cross-dress and have you not notice. And so he was using that as an example of the becoming part that we shouldn't look that way. So we shouldn't be coming to church with short shorts or, you know, whatever that society has that's bad. So it's an interesting concept. So with that in mind, since we know we had temple prostitutes back in the day, and some of them were homosexual temple prostitutes and things like that, if women dressed like men, that would be a something that you would say, no, we're being legalistic about that. Nobody's walking around naked. Nobody's going to look like someone else. You're going to act and dress like a lady, however it is where you come from. If you do things different in your country and you're visiting, that's fine. But you act, you know, you should be able to look at me and say, oh, Ken's a guy, not a problem. You know, and some of us will have long hair and some of the guys will, but hopefully I have a beard. So it's an interesting thing like that. So it could be either connected with Moses' law, showing that I'm not Jewish. It could be something with married people. It could be something with transgenderism. It could be several things. And whatever it is, as you've noticed, the food thing is not a big deal treated in love. Because food is kind of sort of food. But this is a very important thing. I just have no clue what it is. But that's got to be why. If it was one of those things, you could see why you want to make sure people know you're not Buddhist, Hindu, New Age, whatever. You are a Christian. So people can go, hey, I bet that guy could answer my question. You know, and you don't want to look immoral in any way, shape or form, whatever that is in your culture. So I think that's why one is not a big deal or seems like it's not a big deal. And the other one seems like it's a really big deal. I just wish we had some church father to tell us this is exactly what it means. So, uh, have you ever come across a prophetic reference to the Holocaust, whether DSS, early church fathers, or otherwise? Yes, I think there is one. I don't remember, but it talks about um, like a massive destruction and then there is a restoration seems like it's talking about the Holocaust. And that's in that's in our book. I'd have to look it up, but that's in our book, um, Ancient Post-Flood, or no, Ancient Prophecies Revealed. But I think there is one, maybe. I mean, it, it's debated, but I'm going to go ahead. It's nine o'clock, but I'm still going to go ahead and try to get through some of these here. Just uh, uh, Carl Silkwood. Hi, haven't seen you or talked to you for forever. Became a member at... Uh, uh, level angel. Thank you very much. Uh, glad you're here. Which prophecy states something bad made it through the flood? Oh, um, it's a, one of the prophecies in the um, Book of Giants. The Book of Giants tells where it was getting close to the time of the flood and several people and several Nephilim. 
And th this gives us a really good insight to Nephilim were people too, so to speak. They weren't wild animals. They did have reason. And, but they, you know, they had wars and, you know, stuff like that. But there were several prophecies where people had dreams. And it's like in our community, you had a dream, I had a dream. And when we talk about it, we find out you and I had the exact same dream. That's just not possible. So we go talk to a council. While we're there, somebody from another tribe had a different dream, but two or three of them had the same dream together. And so the council now is going like, okay, that's not a thing. So something's going on. So all of these dreams are about the flood. And usually they're like 200 uh, trees, which would be the 200 fallen angels causing destruction and weird things happening. And then a flood of water comes into the garden where the trees are and it destroys everything. Uh, that's the theme of almost all of these dreams. And that's obvious that Nephilim stuff is destroyed in the flood. And then we start over, no problem. But there's one dream where it talks about, it, it actually says that there are 200 trees, that'd be the 200 angels, and they start having weird shoots come up out of their roots. Out of So they're just like spreading evasively through the garden. And this flood comes and destroys everything. Same thing again. But this one prophecy or this one dream, it says that there are gardeners have no clue what a gardener is. It's not the angels, but it's somebody else. These gardeners come and snip off little pieces of the roots. And these little pieces of the roots, uh, they make sure that the water drains off of them. So once the water comes and destroys everything, the roots apparently are still fine. And the roots set there and grow or do whatever they do. But then a fire comes and destroys all of those roots. So when you look at the prophecies, the, the first major catastrophe for the planet was a flood of water. The next one will be fire. So two judgments. So in this dream, of which at least two creatures, they were, I don't think they were human, but anyway, had this dream. And it's the same thing, but something made it through. And so that was really interesting to me because I've always thought, well, the other things show that no Nephilim get through. But it could be Nephilim, some sort of, I, I don't know how that would work, but somehow. Or it could just be the technology gets through. Because we do see the, the Canaan going and finding the writings, recreating it, and then we get giants in Canaan. And we're doing the genetic experiments now, so that kind of stuff, the technology is kind of sort of back already. So maybe that's all it means. But it's definitely something to look into because the main reason for all the dreams is to tell you destruction is coming and even enoch and the others said if you have half a brain if you can repent i would suggest you repent because destruction is coming and so that that's interesting too the way it was described but um that one prophecy is just it, it's too specific little pieces of the tree or the roots are kept by the whoever these people are. And that sounds like maybe records or something, or maybe even somebody kept not just records, but some of the herbs and some of the DNA code, or it's hard to tell, but there's something interesting there. Is there a particular book you can recommend for a 16 year old to read that will help her uh, get interested. She is new to reading the Bible. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I guess it depends on what she would be interested in. I would try to get her interested in prophecies and maybe get like a, a picture book of prophecies. Um, I'm in the process of creating one, but something like that that's already out there. Clarence Larkin did Dispensational Truth and Revelation and did a lot of the, the pictures with it. I think that would probably go a long way. I think it'd go a long way for adults too, just so we can see, instead of trying to imagine the vision and missing a piece, just to see it painted. Um, I would like to, if we, if we can, sometime in the future, start doing... Um, 
books like that on on that reading level you know and, and even earlier like a 10 year old and a 15 year old to try to get them interested in prophecy and that kind of stuff that's about the only thing i can think of is probably one of clarence larkin's books um there are children's books that are bible and not the whole bible of course but anything that's story form they do it in cartoon she might be too old for that but that's another thing you, you could possibly look into have you heard of Nimrod finding both pre-flood writings in stone, having some of the fallen angelic knowledge as well as Adam's original skin clothes? Using both, he turned himself into a Nephilim. Um, the, the legend of the clothes and the, the pre-flood writings are actually in ancient writings. Jasher talks about the ancient, would that be both of them? actually no jasher talks about the clothes and the book of jubilees talks about the pre-flood writing uh canaan was the one that found the writing but canaan and nimrod kind of came together to try to create the empire so that was an interesting time and it talks about he turned himself into a gaborim which is a mighty man and it might mean nephilim and it may not so that's kind of the questionable thing we would need a little more information we've got information on the religious system and the government structure that he put together it was a type of tyranny and it was a religious system based on ancestor worship and astrology so that you know helps us to understand a few things but as far as that stuff goes i don't know for sure 50 dollars donation thank you very much Okay, and let's see, $10 donation. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I thought Passover started today, April 22nd, uh, at least for Jewish people that I know it did. Yes, it would be, it's go, going back to our uh, calendar. There we go. So let me refresh this. I've got 15. Okay. Yeah, it may be. Um, but that would the modern Jewish calendar would have it today or next week. I forget which. Um, and then on the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, Passover is or was April 2nd. So again, when you're going by a lunar calendar, the sometimes they're identical. I mean, they're like right there within a day or on that day. But other times they can be up to two weeks off one way or the other. Uh, this can be off from the equinox, give or take three days. And the Gregorian calendar is just off, give or take a day. So, but it also messes up the weekly count and things like that. So, yeah, there, there are things like that. There's just different calendars. And that's what we're trying to put together and try to figure out prophecy with uh gifted memberships thank you very much again appreciate it i'm sure a lot of people appreciate that for you why do we have passover twice i'm not sure i think the second passover is prophetic in in the bible it's the idea that every single jew must do passover you have to drink wine you have to eat the uh the um the passover lamb so jews were not uh they drank alcohol and they ate meat they're not vegetarians or vegans or anything because that would be illegal okay so that's kind of interesting but they also eat kosher they don't eat regular food like we do just a subset of it which is kosher but uh the ritual they had to do it but sometimes you're sick you're traveling you might be traveling out of state where you can't do a passover seder or whatever if for whatever reason you have to can't do the passover then one month later you have what's called second passover and you're required to do it one of those two times otherwise you're cut off from your people it's that serious of a thing but that's where it came from and then chris asked the question in the same place josephus writes about the temple doors opening and closing by themselves he also mentions a heifer giving birth to a lamb is this a prophecy of Christ or did it literally happen? I don't know. I've often wondered about that. Um, I don't know if that was a vision that happened. It makes more sense to me that so, there would be some sort of a vision that multiple people would see 
And if that's the case, or if even if it happened literally, a heifer giving birth to a lamb, the heifer would be like the red heifer and the lamb being Christ. They're both Christ, but it would definitely show them that Christ is the way for holiness and sanctification. So I'm sure that's what it means. The way that it's written in the text sounds like it actually happened. So that just sounds weird. But again, it could be, you know, a garbling of the text or something. I doubt that it really happened, but either way, it definitely points to Christ. Uh, is there anything in the Dead Sea Scrolls about Christian women wearing head coverings? No, I don't think there's any mention of head coverings at all. Um, I'm sure there probably would be, but since they're fragmented, I don't think we have anything like that. We don't have anything that directly talks about, um, um, not Nephilim, the phylacteries, the uh, Teflon, you know, the, the, the prayer things that you put on your hand and your, your head. Uh, they don't talk about it directly, but there were many Teflon found, or Teflon found. And I thought that was interesting because the, what, what that is, is like a little box and you put scriptures in it. And today there's a certain kind of four separate scriptures you put in. It's always the same. They use different scriptures. So that was kind of an interesting thing that it might be prophetic, but nothing directly about head coverings. Do you think the G7 and G8 nations are delving into forming or are a derivative of forming the Ted Heads, Ted Horns of Daniel? It might be. We'd have to look and see. The main thing we want to look for is seven and ten or a group of ten nations of some sort. Uh, Hippolytus seems to think that the three that of the ten that, that uh, attack the Antichrist are Egypt, Libya, and Sudan. Uh, and that would be like the African bloc of some group. And he could be wrong on that because he's just a church father, but it, that's his opinion. But that means uh, I would look for anybody that's a ten-nation group, and I would be very interested if any of those ten-nation groups have Egypt in them, at least, because Egypt's mentioned by name. Um, again, it's it's speculation at that point, but they may have something like that. Now, Irenaeus said um, that uh, don't bother looking for the Antichrist until, until you see the ten nations arise. So that whole concept that, you know, my name, Kenneth or Kenneth Johnson or however you do it, might equal 666 when spelled out in Greek or Hebrew. or So that's a sign, but it's not like the big sign because there's actually a lot of people that would have. And he gave an example like the word Titan, the word Nero, and uh, I think a couple other examples all equal 666. So there's multiple ones, but obviously nobody named Titan back then. Nero was not it. So the whole idea is look for the 10 nations first. And we can probably begin to see them if we look for the Gog Magog War and the other prophecies like Hamas and in Obadiah and in Amos 6 and those things. The Club of Rome divisions seem to be more plausible with Daniel in Revel and Daniel Revelation to the UN, the WHO, okay, gaining power. It very well could be. I mean, that's definitely something going on at least in the West, the Western division. And we got to remember, we're talking about a Roman empire. So we're talking about Europe being a thing. Um, the Middle East, like Byzantium, Ottoman empire type area being a thing. And then Russia being a thing, how they come together exactly, not sure. But over in the West though, uh, the UN, the WHO, the, World Economic Forum, and those are major powers that could vault an Antichrist into power. So the question is, just make sure we look at all the players and not, because many of our people keep thinking like, oh, I wonder if Biden's the Antichrist. All they ever do is think, and it's just because we're Americans, we never go anywhere. Everything is America. If there's going to be an Antichrist, he's got to be the president of the United States. That's just kind of what's in our mind. And you don't think about, could he be the prime minister of Israel? Could he be the ruler of Russia? You know, or you just never think of that kind of stuff. So we got to be real careful and pull those together. 
So yeah, it could be, uh, and we need to keep looking at that, that kind of stuff. What are your thoughts on the Legacy Standard Bible? I'd have to look it up and see. I don't think I have it in my Bible charts, um, but I'm not sure. I'm sure I'd have to check it out. Let me go ahead at this point, and we'll go ahead and end. It's 930. Thank you for all the questions. We'll continue to do this. Uh, hopefully next week we will get back to our Enoch study because there's some amazing prophecies in there we need to look at. So God bless you guys, and we will see you next week.